Hey everybody, welcome to Anarchy, the podcast about anime with two brothers. I'm Ben. And I'm Guy Montag. Guy Montag. Let's Seriously? see if I can decipher this one. Oh my lord. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh wait, go ahead. Guy Montag. You can show the internet how stupid you are. Dude, I haven't read that book in so long. Yeah, I'm just saying. In so long. I came up with that spur of the moment just now. I definitely didn't Google it earlier today. Uh-huh. Well done. You have out-Googled me. It's Fahrenheit 451. But you don't tell them guessing. that. They're supposed to know. They well, also have access to Google. Well, I say they're... they. That one person. <laughs> that one the, guy. The person the... listening has access to Google. Just the there one. dozens of us. Yeah. Full, full on dozens of us. So uh, what have you been up to since last we spoke? Um, not, not a whole lot. Yeah. I have, I have a couple things. Okay. I did watch, uh, I watched one episode of it, but I read all of Maho Shoujo site, the manga. It's actually pretty good. It does a good dark twist on the magical girl genre, but it's not what? like a twist that comes in the middle, like Madoka. It yeah, just yeah. tells you straight out. Yeah, this is what it is. Well, and it does a really good job nice. of it. Okay, yeah, well, that's good. The show, on the other hand, it pulls its punches. It doesn't quite go where the manga goes, so it's not quite as effective. But but it's worth checking out if you like mangas, like the like mangoes, like mangoes and mango juice. Well, I guess I guess the thing I've done is I finally caught up with the new season of uh, of Green Naruto. Oh, good. And how are you finding it? Still good? You know, it's still good. It's it's now taken another beat from Naruto, where the foil ally is going to be tempted by the evil organization. Well, that's what you do, right? I mean, that's Sasuke. Sasuke in one. I don't think that's just a Naruto thing. This is, this is gonna like, end. This is gonna end in bug farting. I, we all know it. I don't doubt that. It's just all may, gonna may, maybe be the sticky hair guy. Oh, what? Huh? I don't know any of their names. I just know there's a sticky hair guy that's a creep. Stick, oh yeah, he's the gross one. Well, hold on. You got my summary of the of yes. the hero kids, right? <laughs> that yes. is extraordinarily accurate. You know what's funny is I don't know who any of the characters are because I haven't watched it yet. That's fine. But watching this clip of the guy going through every single one of those characters just by yeah. pointing at them, I know who it is before he says it. Oh, yeah, probably. The character designs are really good because they inform you of the character. Like, they're, they're yeah. legit good character designs in the, how they how they tell you what the character is like. Yeah, you don't need explained. You just know. Yeah. It's good. I like the Falcon's Bizarre Adventure. Falco's Bizarre Adventure, yeah. <laughs> I like it. He, he has a, a stand. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> His superpower is he has a stand. It's well done. That's nice. Ooh, I yes. have a Lord of the Rings story for you. Oh, okay. It doesn't necessarily have to do with me reading the books, but it does have to do okay. with a wedding I went to. All right. All right. So I went to a wedding last week and during the wedding, the minister okay. mentioned that he wanted to have a Lord of the Rings quote. This is part of his speech. He mentioned okay. that he wanted to sure. have a quote. So he's like, so I wanted to have this quote from my son who's getting married and his wife to be. And I thought I'd get it from Lord of the Rings. And at first I thought of Arwen and, and Aragorn. They're only in an appendix. And that's what I thought. I was like, well, why would he do that? But it's, it's pretty stereotypical. But here's the twist. He said, no, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Because recently I read the books. And I was like, well, maybe he could reread the books or maybe he just read all the Tolkien books, who knows? And he's not going to go with Arwen and Aragorn. Oh. I was like, oh. Well, clearly then, the only other logical choice, if you're going to do a love story, is uh, Baron and Luthien. Yes. The best love story in the entire Tolkien universe, It's right? very good. It's very good. Tolkien wrote it in 1918 for his lovely wife. Yeah, it's very good. Very good story. And if I may recap really quick for the listeners at home, Baron, man, meets elf girl, in forest they fall in love he wants to get married to her but her dad the king says you're a man screw off we don't want none of that he's like but i really love her and she's like i really love him so he's like okay fine uh how about you go steal a cimmeril from satan over there he's like and yeah he sure okay <laughs> he's very good he a good boy <laughs> so it's a good story he and his fiance go steal one he comes back the king relents but fate catches up with him and then he dies and then she dies of grief. It's very sad. Very sad, but very good. Yeah, and she goes to elf purgatory, which is not the same as where men go. No one knows where men go. Goes to elf purgatory and cries so much and is so sad that death has pity on her. And is like, okay, look, 
You can either go to elf heaven or I can bring you and your husband back to life. But when you die, you go wherever they go. And I have no idea where that is. She's like, I'll take that option. So they option uh, B. Yeah. They come back to life because of their love for each other. Yeah, it's very good. And then good. And they grow old and die together. Hooray. Very good. So I was like, well, it's going to be that, obviously. Obviously. That's not what it was. Was it? Was it? Uh, was it? Uh, hold on. Hold it on. was Tom Bombadil. Excellent. I love it. Tom Bombadil. And he's like, well, the, the, their their home was a place of peace and full of grace. Apparently, my wife, who was the maid of honor, saw me because I was sitting near the aisle. And apparently I had this look of shock and horror on my face throughout the remainder of this quote. He, he gave some part of the song that he sang, which was not the full song because well, if he had he, read the full he, song. Here's the thing, though. If you do, if you do the story of Tom Bombadil, you actually go to the actual poem of just Tom Bombadil, the poem itself, which is longer. Yeah, I don't think he did that. Well, see, that that's the part you read because it's really good. And so for, for those at home that may not have read Lord of the Rings and or remember Tom Bombadil. Uh, he's the best character. Uh, he's literally the worst character. Literally and, the best character. <laughs> uh, short stories, hobbits find him. He talks a lot about how he's cool and how his wife is hot and how he does her like all the time. I think you may be paraphrasing here a bit incorrectly, but go on. And they give him the the ring. And he puts it on. Nothing happens. He takes it off. He's like, cool ring, bro. And they're like, whoa, that's it doesn't affect you. Could you like help us throw it in that volcano over yonder? Be real, like real quick. Just hop over there. Come back. He's like, mm, could do that. But my wife's hot. No, uh, you, you guys, you guys handle that. And then they off they go. Now, I should point out that. When the hobbits first encounter Tom Bombadil, uh, he doesn't know they're there, and he's singing to himself. Tom and Bombadil I, is such a nerd. And if I remember correctly, his song some, goes something like, I got a dope hat. I got yeah. yellow boots. <laughs> sure does. My wife is super hot, and I'm going to bang her a uh, lot. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think you, I think that's about wrong, but no. you know, it, it's, it's in that realm. Okay. I actually brought this up with a friend of mine at dinner tonight, and he's like, I don't I don't think he did say that he was going to bang her a lot. But he went up and looked at the, the poems and doesn't say that specifically. But as he kept rereading it, he's like, oh, that's totally what he's saying, because he's basically going at every opportunity. You guys know my wife is really hot. Did I mention that she's really hot? She is, she is. really hot. There's a lot of winking going on, I assume. It's not something that I would bring up at a wedding. Let's put it that way. I mean, it could be. <laughs> Hold on, was 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 the bride hot? I'm not I'm not one to say because well, I have my own wife and I will never say that. <laughs> I will not comment one way or the other. But yeah, it was uh, Tom Bombadil. Mm. As, as listeners may know, I probably brought it up before. He's the reason I couldn't complete Lord of the Rings two of the three times I tried reading. That's it. because you dislike good things. No, oh, it's because I, I don't like dumb stuff. No, I'm pretty sure it's because you don't like good things. And Tom Bombadil goes on for two or three full chapters, I think. It's like one. No, it's it's longer than just one. It may be two halves. It's, you know, it's It may be the back half of one and the front half of another. It's, it's not my favorite. But once you get past that, the rest of the book is great. That's because you don't like whimsy and happiness in things. I do. Ah. I, just, I just don't like... T I don't like... So look, here's the thing is... Goldberry's fine and she's fine, but she's fine in the book. But it's, it's just Tom Bombadil, just that guy. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no. I mean, no, nah, I don't like do. that guy. Is he your favorite? Is he your I mean, favorite man in the entire series? Is that I what mean, you're I, saying? I, I do like Tom Bombadil quite a bit. Of course you do. He, he brings whimsy and joy. Does he? Yeah. And all the sorrow in the world because he didn't help him out. I mean, sort Could've of not him out really. Go ahead. You just snuck it over there really quick and dealt with it. But, you know, whatever, whatever. It kind of, it would kind of undermine the themes of the whole book. So. I realize that but you shouldn't have brought him up in the first place, Tolkien. Okay, come on. No. Not that I'm arguing with a master, but seriously. Yeah, but you literally are. So, yeah, go ahead. Well, since we're having a war over uh, literary characters. Oh, see, there you go. That's a pretty decent segue. Let's, uh, let's jump into library wars. Or war. It's Japanese. Or it's in so.
This week, we decided to watch the show from 2012 and from production IG, Library War. Maybe. Question mark. Plural, maybe not plural. It's based off light novels. It is based off light novels. Extremely mm-hmm. popular in Japan. Not only does it have an anime, but I think it has two OVAs and a couple live action movies. Really? Yeah. I, would, I think the live action movies would probably be pretty good. I think honestly. they're probably really good. Yeah. I would imagine. Uh, so I have a good pitch for this show that I should have done last time. Go for it. Okay, so Fahrenheit 451, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so what if we combine that with a little bit of like 1984, okay? Okay. Okay, yeah. now let's make it a rom-com. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. It's real good. I <laughs> like that very more. It's real good. So it's a it's a Jose. At the at the end of the day, it's a Jose with uh with a military backdrop is basically what it ends up being. Yeah, when you frame it like that, it makes it and, a little more palatable. And, and that's the correct framing, is that it's a Jose with a military backdrop. Is pretty much yeah. what you have to do with it. Because it is very weird and it's buy-in. It's like uh suspension of disbelief buy-in is pretty high. Really high. Once you frame it with that, you're like, yeah, all right. And as you watch okay. on, you're like, you know, honestly. If censorship were going to go down in this harsh of a way, this is probably how it about end up where it's like a detente that doesn't affect most people, but affects the people it's going to affect in very strange ways. Yeah, I could see that. So, so the quick synopsis is. In a world where censorship has been made legal, the libraries remain the last bastion of free thought and media, and they defend those liberties with guns. Yeah. That's what they did. Enter Kasahara Iku, a new recruit who dreams of being the first female on the library task force. The seals of the literary world. Can she rise through the ranks to attain her dream? Of her boyfriend. Yes, she (laughs) finds her boyfriend. Her boyfriend. Her (laughs) prince. Which is also the brand of beer they drink in the show, and it never ceases (laughs) to delight me. Is it really? I didn't notice that. Yeah, you didn't notice that. (laughs) I did not. (laughs) It's mostly a Jose. That's delightful. Okay, so just so you know, not having the framing of Jose in mind for the last week, I may be a little harsh on the show. <laughs> yeah, it's not a war drama, brother. But but as it's as a cute little Jose it, with a weird with a weird framing device. As you have reframed it as Jose, <laughs> my my thoughts on it have softened a little bit. Yeah, here, I mean, that's here what in it the is. moment. Okay. At the at the end of the day, that's what it is. Yeah. It's not a war drama. This is Gundam, this ain't. No. Legend of the Galactic Heroes, this very isn't. Just at a high level, what did you think of the show? Oh, I really like it. I mean, it's really cute. Yeah. It's not, it's nothing to like, you know, praise to high heavens, but if you want like a cute thing like this, it's, I it's pretty I definitely good. assumed that you would like it because it has a short-haired, androgynous tsundere type. She's not, she's not. She's pretty tsundere. Uh, she's a little tsundere. Ah, but... Did you but, not? You didn't see the secret reason why I definitely love it. I did not. What is it? Who? What is her roommate? Oh, a he may cut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. A plus. Except, except I will say that Kasahara is definitely not fem leaning. So there's your problem. Oh, is she not? I mean, she's feminine, but she's definitely she's not what one would call fem leaning androgynous. Oh. I may not be up on all my woke she, terminology. I mean, she would she would be definitely masculine leaning. I mean, that that's that's their thing, right? That's her character. She's 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 almost she's too manly. Yeah, she's too manly for this for this stuff, especially compared to her he may cut roommate. So I thought it was a very interesting concept, especially from your description last time, and definitely yeah, yeah. from your description this time. The characters ultimately likable. Oh yeah, and, yeah. But they sort of came across mostly as non offensive. Uh, yeah, they're, and they're, I would say that this is this show is safe, which is odd given its subject matter. But at the end know, of the right? day, the show's a very safe show. And I felt like the execution could have been a lot, a lot better, which is why I uh, said define, the, the, the movie is probably better. Yeah, define execution. Mostly the direction of the show. Yeah, yeah OK, as was, in like the actual like animation direction and the directing. actual animation direction and wins. When information was given to us. Yeah. All right. There, there were a lot of directorial decisions that. Yeah. Normally uh, I don't even pick on those, but it was just so blatant this time. Yeah, It's directed far more like not even a Jose. It's it's almost uh, directed more like a like a shoujo. Yeah. In some ways. 
which you know it's it's all right you you don't watch it for the animation or the directing you watch it for the for the for the cute story and i will be honest if someone had just recommended this to me and weren't doing it for the show i probably would have dropped it after the first episode because i wasn't sold on the concept after one episode at all sure i ended up i think giving it like a five it's fine it's fine it's okay i wouldn't again uh you watch it because the characters are cute and their their interactions are good the world is interesting but at the end of the day it's not like a slam dunk everybody should watch this but if you are into this sort of thing if you're into a jose with a military backdrop then yes and i don't know too many of those yeah there aren't very many but this is definitely a good one like i said that framing that changes a lot of a lot of stuff yeah you gotta look at it that way if you think it's a military drama eh, no (laughs) that it isn't yeah though if i recall from my good pals ingram description they actually get a lot of gun stuff right which is very nice which he always appreciates it's not Mm -hmm. like you're under arrest where their guns don't work because it's cold (laughs) that happens sometimes yeah well you're under the rest is a good show but uh gun accuracy is not uh (laughs) not the best not not in the forefront uh it was all written by a woman do keep that in mind though also library war yeah yeah. So it's a Jose by by a woman, not by a man, which Hero most Jose's Arakawa. are. But yeah. It's good. I like Library War overall. Yeah. So let's get into spoiler lane and actually discuss some some details. Sure. How about we start with the characters and Kasahara specifically? What do you think of Kasahara? I like Kasahara. She's she's very emotional, but in a good way, in a way that makes sense, especially once you meet her mom. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. this is who you get it from. <laughs> Her mom is very, <laughs> very emotion <laughs> and overbearing. Oh, very and just, so. And just scary. Also true. And very guilt trippy. Yeah. Like there's a lot of emotional blackmail going on in the relationship. Yeah, her mom is not the best, but you can definitely see where Kazuhara gets her very emotional streak from. But she's emotional for legitimate reasons a lot of the time. I think the first thing we need to do point out before we go much further is why Kasahara joined the... Library Defense Force? The Library Defense Force in the first place, because that's a very important part of her character. She joins because at the beginning of the show, she's out buying a book that she wants when she's to in get. like early high school or something. Yeah, and apparently the government censor bureau is going to come in. Uh, and the media take the book. betterment bureau, which is a very good Orwellian name, because I do if like this were name. to happen, that's what they would call it. So she's out buying her book, and they come in. They're going to take the book away from her, but this mysterious senpai prince comes in and, and saves her at the last second. by. And here's one of the wonderful the, things. Here's one of the wonderful things about this scene. Okay. Yeah. So what happens is she gets knocked down by the guys because he's trying to, she's trying to pull the book away and falls down. Mm-hmm. And the guy that shows up is so tall and so handsome because she's fallen on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And he whips out his badge and is like, no, I'm going to procure all of these books, all these banned books for the library instead. Because what the what the what the library can do so sort of the the grand compromise of the censorship law is that libraries can keep books any books they want and they can defend them if they want, uh, but nobody else can. So they can go to bookstores and procure uh, things for the library. Yeah. So if something's going to get blacklisted, they can go basically commandeer it before it does. Yep. And that's what he does for her favorite book. So she gets to. I don't think she gets to keep the book. Or does she, she does. She does. That because particular copy? Yeah, because um, she has it this, in her this, dorm room. This, yeah. this prince character is like, uh, we already have enough of this book. You can keep this one. It's cool. And so she wants to join. Not only does she want to join because she wants to do the same ideals as this princely character. Also wants to meet him. Wants also to meet be- him and, and fall and in then, love, etc. Yeah. Also because she thirsts with her pure maiden heart. Of course. Uh, I thought that Kasahara was very endearing, especially in the first couple episodes. Yeah. But I didn't feel like she changed a whole lot. I, I would give you that. She doesn't change a whole lot until the end. And I think this is one of those things where I imagine all of this series is the first are things that happen in the first light novel. Don't quote me mm-hmm. on that. I don't know. And that would explain why she doesn't change until like the end because of just like weird pacing issues. Here's the thing is her personality. Okay, fine. That that can change at the end because she goes through some trauma yeah. throughout the, the show. The thing that kept bothering me was yeah, sure. she's she's super clumsy. And this is a paramilitary group. And everyone keeps promoting her to different positions based on, well, she'll grow into it. Well, that's part of it. I wouldn't say she's super clumsy. 
but she's, she's also pretty clumsy. She's she's strong and fit and fast because she was on she was on track. Well, this comes up. She's just a bad shot. This comes up when they go to protect that one art exhibit. Yeah, and the the local defense force isn't well trained. They haven't been in practice for quite some time, so they're having the Kanto region force train them. And while Kasahara is training <laughs> the the local defense people, while she's doing it, her superior who's standing behind her is like, so how is how are they all doing? Like, how are they all measuring up? Uh, they're about as good as Kasahara. Kasahara then or Kasahara now? What's the difference? She still sucks. <laughs> I'm like, then why did you promote her? <laughs> well, I think, again, it has to do with... Uh... She she's not very good at shooting because that was specifically on the firing range. It was, but there was and a lot she's of things not like, even she's not being used in the task force as uh, for shooting. She's mm-hmm. used either. She's used for her speed and for her agility. OK, that, that makes more sense. But it, it just kept coming up like, yeah, she no, falls over fair. things, it, drops it can, stuff. Yeah, it can be the butt of some jokes, which is a bit odd, considering, again, she's part of an elite task force. It's like having no here's the seal. Clo- here's the seal team six character a buddy's clumsy it's like okay <laughs> runs in the always, doors sometimes it was, it was always fumbles so dojo how about, how about him our good old pal dojo dojo's the best now you want to talk about yandere <laughs> i guess he's not yandere you want to talk about tsundere type he's pretty tsundere too dojo's the best so ben have you seen no dame contabule i have not okay it's been on my list you should watch no dame contabule because do you want this show but it's music <laughs> and makes a little more and makes a little more sense because it's just music based and not military based. Sure. With characters that are extremely similar to the characters you got in this show. I do. Then you should watch No Dame Cantabile because turns out you do. OK, I will keep that in mind. No Dame V good. Dojo, I think, was my favorite character. Dojo is really great. Not only Even- is not only is he a good character, but he's actually probably the deeper one of the deeper characters in the show because the show the characters in this are kind of safe and a little little surface level they're i wouldn't quite put them as two-dimensional but you know they're like 2.2 2.5 dimensional dojo is definitely the deepest and i think i like him the most because he's what because they they keep bringing up that kasahara is an early version of dojo oh he's like a she they're spitting images of each other yeah but dojo has already crossed the line of i'm not that ideal little bugger that i used to be yeah, I've, I've been through some stuff. I'm more realistic now. He just comes across as well-rounded, whereas yeah, as, most as a, of the other characters don't. a chilled out don't. version of Kasahara. Yeah, and he's great. And especially all the jokes that play off the fact that he's shorter than Kasahara. He's very short. And there's very good jokes <laughs> that he is the, way shorter than Kasahara. The best joke, I think, is when Kasahara has been courted by that one brother of one of the other characters guy. Yeah, yeah. And Dojo comes and rescues her. She starts crying and whatnot, and he oh. like goes to pat her head, but she's also in heels, so she's and like a foot taller super than him. Super can't reach. What I like <laughs> is like Kasahara is made out to be tall, and she is tall, but she's not like ridiculously tall. She's not taller than all of the men around her. She's taller than well, Dojo. <laughs> yeah, just Dojo because he's kind of on the short side. He is. I think we did the math, and he's like five four, and she's Aww. like you know you know she's like five eight or something, which is pretty tall for a Japanese lady. Yeah, and but he and he's like five four, and it's just like the teeniest. <laughs> he's just a tiny, angry little man. And I do like the fact that throughout the show, anytime they're together, even in inconsequential scenes, he's still shorter than she is. Very much so. I like that kind of consistency. Any others? I thought all the other ones, like you sort of pointed out, they're not one dimensional or two dimensional. They're like yeah, slightly above that. Yeah, but yeah, not I mean, much they- more. Yeah, the characters have enough depth to make them satisfying as characters, but they're not, they're nothing like, it's a character drama driven by Kasahara and Dojo with a supporting cast. Shibazaki, I think, is probably the closest one. That's the Hime cut? Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. She's the, she's the Hime cut roommate. Yep. Who has the information network. She has the information network and sort of the uh, woman of the world advice for Kasahara. Yeah. I just like when, why, what is it? They're talking about love and like Kasahara says something very like naive and, and, uh, he may cut, just goes to the window, throws it open, goes, steps out onto the balcony. He's like, we, we have a, we have a pure hearted maiden in here. Hey guys, <laughs> guys, <laughs> it's very good. I did like that. It, it's nice. a good bit. Let's do some, uh, story arcs. They're 
kind of weird story arcs. Like you don't get the feeling that they're full fleshed out plots, but yeah. sort of general things. First one was like getting into the task force. Uh, that was like the first one or two episodes. First, yeah, about first two episodes, really, because it's the task force and then sort of like how it works. Like I said, not really clear on why someone that clumsy, especially at the time, would suddenly get onto the task force. And the reason we're given is, like I said, she shows spunk and potential. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, is um, she definitely gets in on recommendation because two people get in. It's her who's basically there via recommendation and her physical skills. They say that over and over. While mm-hmm. it might not be her shooting, it's her athleticism that's really the one of the tipping points. And then the other guy who gets on the task force is, uh, oh, what's his name? Who's like an asshole at the beginning, but then is like a really good doofy guy. Uh, like uh, Hikaru? Yeah. Uh, he, yeah That's his first name. That's what his brother calls him. I don't remember okay. his actual name. I don't know. I'm miserable with names in the best of circumstances. I did like, so, well, like is a strong word for this. At the end of the second episode, there's a battle. And I use quotes around that word. There's a, there's a battle at yeah. a library. <laughs> they shoot at each other. <laughs> They, they shoot at each other. No one gets hurt. And it's it's a it's a huge deal. Let's, let's set that aside. The point of the battle was there was this collection of books by this old rich guy who died. And they're going to rescue these books from his estate using a, a chopper that's going to pick up some container crates. Yeah, yeah. Books, right? OK, so this is kind of the, the next battle. OK, sure. I thought yeah. you were talking about the one where uh, the one earlier where uh, somebody's been checking out strange books and they're trying to figure out why they're all gone and they're just up in the guy's office and the oh, no. censorship That's... bureau comes in but sure yeah. so during this battle uh they the chopper comes in takes one of the containers away comes back some people have been wounded people do get shot in this yeah. show no one dies in this show uh, uh, but, but uh, people uh, that's get not shot. quite true no one just... we care about <laughs> no killed. no no principles <laughs> get, get killed <laughs> no one's seen on screen Faceless no minions can killed. die, but very rarely. <laughs> they do a decent job of hand waving why this is later, at least. Some people have been wounded, and this this chopper's taking off, and they're like, "Come on, guys, uh, take these wounded with you to the hospital." First of all, side note: the battle is almost over because it's almost nine a.m., and that's when it stops. Let's yeah. ignore why that's even a thing. But yeah, well, so they're like, "Let's evacuate these these guys on the chopper," and the pilot says, "We ain't got no room." Too much weight. They're like, oh, take him anyway. We really need him to get out of here. Okay, fine, says the pilot. And he goes to lift off. Well, there's too much weight. And the the container only lifts about a foot off the ground. What do? And I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to like have a a crisis of of conscience (laughs) and be like, okay, we got to leave one of you behind right now. So make a decision right quick. But instead, what happens is the pilot... Heart of the card style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he wills he, he, he his guards chopper it <laughs> to fly higher and make it out of there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what you I, get. I, I was literally hands in the air, going, <laughs> "What?" Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's let's Tony Kaku that. Let's put that aside <laughs> because there's another interesting thing that happens here. If we're going to, yeah. if we get to ignore that. Let's mm-hmm. ignore it. Let's just set it aside. Because right after that, we do get the the interesting politics of the whole situation where they were going, for all intents and purposes, they made it seem like they were going to airlift off three things. But mm-hmm. the third one was just always like, this is stuff we had backup copies. So we'll let the censorship force come in and censor all this stuff because- And pretend like they got us or something. Yeah, exactly. Because like yeah. there's there's all these little things with the, with the world building in the show that are like that. They're like- these are things that I find believable on how a more violent censorship could happen and the entire country not just fall into civil war or something. Yeah. But it's like there's just all these little compromises that both sides are making to make the system not quite work, but, you know, kind of work. Yeah. I will grant you that in every scenario where a majority of it, I'm hands in the air going, what in the world is going on? There's usually... In all those scenarios, one kernel of something that I'm like, actually, that's pretty clever in that yeah. situation. Yeah, that's a that's a good move. I like that move. Yeah. Well, even like when they don't we're not very many where both sides don't seem to shoot to kill for specific for a very good reason, where it's like the first person that's actually like killing people over the censorship law, they're going to get slammed. <laughs> that's not necessarily true uh, when we get to the end, because apparently yeah. the media is in the pocket of the government. Some some media outlets are most, definitely most of it. Yeah. Most of the mainstream media is that mainstream media. You trust them every time. Lit- oh, Fake wait, censorship. You know, 
Literally, this is InfoWars. Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> By tactical the, soap. The, the books are causing or turning all the frogs gay. That is what's that, going on. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, so the next arc we had was the parents. The parent arc, I like the, I like that episode. It, it was a good arc. That's a very good little episode. That episode well, by itself, nice contained. I liked it. I liked it. I like, I like it when the parent stuff comes back later too. That uh, part I didn't, end. I didn't care for so much because it felt a little forced. It's like, I mean, we already dealt with this. That's fair. Well, they had half dealt with it and they sort of resolve it. I do like how her parents, especially her mom, not wanting to be part of the uh, library defense force and especially not the. Task the mili- the task the military wing of it is a good plot point and a point of contention. I do like the fact that they were used by the bullies at yeah. the uh, the local district. I'm like, yep. okay, that is definitely the dickish move they could pull. Yep, an A plus dick move. A plus dick move. Didn't like that it was something we'd already tread on, but still A plus dick move. Yeah. Uh, her dad's cool. Her dad it does end up being cool. He he's wise. He's wise to what's going on. He figured it out, and his mom and her mom is overprotective and weird. Next arc I have is the future library project arc, which I think is probably the most problematic one. Oh, really? I was gonna say it's probably the one of the better ones, but yeah, go ahead. So the idea is there's some subterfuge going on, which I liked where that was going. There's yeah. finally some subterfuge in our military show, but it, everything sort of seems headed towards there are two factions in the library there's governmentalists and there's more i think they're called libertarians libertarians i hope it should have been libertarians so there's two factions and the founders, it been, it's the founders group is what they call it it would have been nice if this had been alluded to earlier in the show I would that's have liked fair a little fo- yeah because they're just they're just like well they they get a good hand wave was like kasahara dude you're in here because you run real good be and not because you sleep through all of your classes on actual yeah. stuff, but still, but, yeah, yeah, that, that's like definitely, people, it's definitely a real life. It's definitely a hand wave. Please don't notice that we're info yeah. dumping you this stuff right now. Well, they still could have info dumped, but it could have been like an offhanded, oh, this person needs to see you, by the way, they're a yeah. governmentalist. Just, yeah. just name drop the thing so we know that it's coming up. Anyway, that's not my main problem with it. Even when the future library project is finally revealed for the evil plot that it is, I didn't know why it was evil. Like I never got the, what their end goal was. We're just explained that Hikaru's brother wants to make the libraries a governmental entity so that they don't have these stupid firefights anymore. And that is, as he says, without censorship. Yes, but I think the, um, but it was never explained how that's going to work and why that is somehow evil. Well, I think the at the end of the day, the way they make it no censorship is they just do the thing where it's like, well, if only approved books get published, there won't be anything to censor. That that is hmm. I think that's kind of where it was going that and like even the future libraries projects plan is join up with the government. So we have a say in how these laws work. Mm -hmm. Question mark, question mark, question mark. We'll solve the problem later. But at least we're in. It's a let's solve the problem from the inside, but we're going to have to compromise now to get inside, though we don't really have a good like middle part of the plan yet. You're right. That's what we're given. But it felt like the brother did have a mid like a mid range goal. Told what it is. And we're just yeah. not told what it is. Yeah, I think for the most part, what Hikaru's problem with the future project is, is their methods. And if their methods are already sketchy now, like, do you want those guys in charge of like yeah. your media organization? I think that's what comes because it's it's never shown that he's like legit evil. The show. It wants you to think that he's evil. It and I directorally like, frames it that way. I agree. Yeah. He's got the whole he's in the penthouse. He's yeah. got the evil glasses. I think all given the actual text of the show and not any of the subtext of the animation, it's less that he is outright evil and more, you know, his methods are sketchy as all get out and like letting the government come in to our the way our system works. Mm -hmm. is all it seems like a bad plan and we don't want a part of it yeah and when he was explaining his plan to especially with how many times he like he does help them so yeah and and when he explains his plan to kasahara to try to recruit her it seemed pretty reasonable up there until the end where he's like oh by the way this is gonna take 10 years and we may have to burn some books along the way yeah it's like okay that's a little sketchy but the rest of it seems pretty much the same thing to do instead of shooting people yeah but okay so I, I never got why it was evil, even though the show kept trying to tell me 
this guy is evil and everyone is super freaked out by him. The framing, the, yeah. the environment, the, the music, everything points to this guy is like the bad guy. And then yeah. it turns out he's just a normal other dude. That yeah, I think it's different. because the way the show was constructed, they wanted to have some sort of like bad guy moment when it's like, no, he's not really a bad guy. He's just a sketchy dude they don't really want to deal with. Yeah. Like nobody really wants to, to deal with him. None of the good guys want to deal with him because of how sketch his methods are. And one other thing I had was at the very end of that arc, uh, he tells Kasahara that even if she if she does not deliver his message to Hikaru, that he needs to join up or he's not going to stop framing Kasahara for the trouble that she's in. Yeah, he says he's going to drop it all if he, she delivers the message and she says, screw you, I'm not going to deliver the message. And he's like, fine, have it your way. And then 30 seconds later, he just unframes her. Which is yeah. exactly what he said he wasn't going to do. Yeah. I'm like, but wait, what? What happened just then? The, the, the reason he gives is because, like, he doesn't want to f*** around with Dojo, which is both a bad answer and a good one. Yeah. I mean, it's a good answer for a Jose. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's why I think that's probably the weakest arc, because I wasn't really given clear reasons for... Yeah, that's fair. It's legit. Not liking the guy. Uh, and then we have the, the final battle, which is like three episode uh, arc three episode at arc, the end yeah. uh, with the art display. It's yeah. uh, probably actually closer to about four episodes now. I think about it. Oh, yeah, it would be episode nine. I will be honest here. I'll be honest. I accidentally skipped episode nine. <laughs> That's and, fine. And what episode was it? No, I didn't uh, notice for two episodes. Then you were probably OK. Um, <laughs> that was the one where she realizes that Dojo's her prince the whole time. Oh, oh, but that one's so cute. No, I went back and watched it. But at the time, I was like, yeah, I mean, you don't really miss anything for it, to be honest. I should be on episode 11 over here. But yeah, oh, the only the one. only th the only real thing that you would miss is. Yeah, there's really nothing you'd actually miss in it. Just yeah. Cute character interactions. The fact that she got promoted, I guess. But that barely matters. Right. So but, the final battle. I think the 10th episode, the the one with all the bullying, where she goes to the, the local region and she just gets hardcore hazed. Oh, super hard. That is like, that's probably the strongest episode of the entire series. It's it really, really good. Because we got character growth from Kasahara. We got uh, some development of their relationship between her and Dojo. We got some development of a relationship between Hikaru and uh, Shibazaki. Yep. I mean, there, there's just a lot of stuff that happened and there's, in the episode. Uh, yeah, and there's a uh, political development of revealing information about the world. Yeah. So, like, th yeah, there's a lot. There's lots of good stuff in 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 this arc. Good, um, good, good arc. Like this arc. Yeah. One thing that I really liked was during the battle itself, Kasahara. I didn't understand her mind frame when she went berserk, but the end result of her going berserk was a plus. Would watch again. Yeah, well, and, and for multiple reasons, because especially like, oh, she's in shock because she just shot a bunch of people. It's she like just very shot. legitimate. It's like, yes, that is how that works. Yeah, she has this like weird flashback ish scene right before yeah. she does this that I did not follow at all. Yeah, it's hard to exactly see where that through line is. But, but I'm like, OK, she's going on a rampage and she goes on a rampage, which was super awesome. Definitely yeah. worth it. And then she has the normal reaction of a uh, of a real human being, which is like, yeah. holy shit, what did I do? Of an Otome who just uh, shot a bunch of people with an Uzi, you know, yeah. shock, a lot of shaking. Yeah. Of like, please calm down. Feeling very sick. Probably not all of them died. You're probably OK. Yeah, it's fine. Sure. They had armor on. I think the, the weakest part of this this arc is twofold. One is the. Battle again somehow has a deadline and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, and again, the the battle deadlines, I think again, like that's part of the the sort of way in which hmm, how to word this right. Uh, it's the way it's the conceit of the world, right, where both sides do their best to keep the public on their side by making sure they don't involve civilians. So, sort of the idea is is whenever these libraries or the supposed like sort of free speech zones are open to the actual public there's a detente yeah and that's the idea it's to keep it's to keep things from getting too out of hand because even earlier in the show right they have the thing where it's like you're not allowed to shoot outside of library grounds yeah if you get caught doing that you get in, in pretty big trouble 
I felt like that's the case, but it just seems weird that it is a little odd that they at just 9 have like deadlines. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take a timeout, and <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think they're gonna go home. Actually, that you guys gonna go home? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, yeah. uh, we'll we'll meet you down at the coffee shop at uh, quarter after then. Yeah, it's kind of just a weird <laughs> conceit of the world, but one that uh, makes sense when you. Unlike most conceits, it makes a little more sense when you stop and think about it rather than falling apart upon closer inspection. OK, so this particular arc, there's like this this piece of art that's made out of one of the censorship goons suits. And it's yeah. like showing how they're evil. Fine. Uh, they've put it out outside and it's covered by this giant bulletproof glass cube. And they want to do that so they don't hurt anything else and have anything else in the museum getting shot. Cool. And we're told that the government is only going to take one shot at capturing this thing. Not sure why, but th their pride is on the line is, is the gist of it. And we have this interesting scene that it's not Hikaru. It's the guy that gets shot and is uh, Dojo's. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dojo's friend. Roommate. His Dojo's friend and roommate. He's cool. I like him. He's pretty cool. He goes out to get food and he runs into the government agent that actually did shoot him at the convenience store. And he looks down in his bag and he's got all these bottles. Yeah. And my thought when I saw those bottles is, man, he's got a whole bag full of paint. And I thought, wow, that's actually really smart. They could actually accomplish their mission because their mission is to capture the thing or get the exhibition suspended or canceled altogether. One of the two or three. Yeah, but that's see, their mission. Th that just shows that you're, you don't. You don't know what a Japanese energy drink looks like. I, I don't. And, but, that's what uh, like. and I didn't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't think that that much paint would like actually do the thing. But it got me thinking that would actually be a really good plan. Yeah, just if they did paintballs like, and just paintballed it. Paintballed or like got opaque gorilla glue and just dropped it on the cube. Wouldn't yeah. kill anybody. You've basically canceled the event because now no one can see the thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, they could just take the cube off, I guess. I mean, they, they could, but you've still... There's a whole lot of reasons why that wouldn't make sense from their perspective. So it's like, that seems like a good idea instead of just shooting each other for a couple hours and nothing happening. So that happens. And then we get the, I feel like the weakest part of the entire show, which is Ginda, the, the big, he's big captain guy. Yeah. He's the captain of the, of the special forces. After 9am, one of the government guys has decided, well, he's had enough. He doesn't care about the rules. Screw the rules. He has a gun an automatic weapon and he goes up. He's like, I'm going to shoot this thing anyway. And Ginda stands in front of the bulletproof glass and says, no, I will guard this bulletproof glass with my body and my life. And this dude just unloads into him. Now, first off, this is a very good moment that shows good conviction by the characters. The problem is, is it once again, my Otome's it or yep. my Hime it, whichever it is. I always forget. <laughs> he gets shot. We're told in the next episode, 30 two times by yeah. an automatic fully automatic assault rifle yeah he's cool now would you like to know because i googled this the world record for number of times shot and surviving you know i actually would it is 21 times by oh, a guy that was shot by police in brooklyn oh wow now that man was shot 21 times with a handgun yeah. ginda was shot 32 times with rifle ammunition well, okay. Now, hold on. I don't think this is an actual rifle. I think this is a submachine gun. It's the same kind that they use. But yeah, I mean, your point still stands. He should super be dead. <laughs> he should also, super be also, dead. Also, it's more narratively satisfying if he dies protecting the art. I know, right? So, I mean. Yeah, this. You, this you, you have no argument. It. You have no argument for me on this point at all. They didn't. They didn't pull just a Mahime. They pulled a Samurai Champloo. The yeah. guy's basically dead. But if you give him enough bandages and enough bed rest. He will He's be cool. totally okay. <laughs> He's like, man, that socialized medicine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> They're very good. It's very good. Best in the uh, world. But overall, I really like this arc. I think it's it's probably the best representative of the show. Well, and I like um, going back just a minute to when the two subordinates are talking to each other from opposite sides. Mm -hmm. Like, I like how the, the Betterment Bureau guy is like, you know, a lot of the people in the Betterment Bureau are just like really don't care. Like part part of the reason this conflict ends up the way it is is because like you guys in the Library Defense Force are actually principled, and like nobody in the Betterment thing is actually very principled. The higher up the bigwigs are, but we are actually just goons. It's just a job. 
Like, it's just a job for just about everybody in it. Nobody actually believes in censorship because, like, yeah, no, we know what's up. <laughs> it's like everybody in the government's just covering their own ass. Yeah, sure, mm-hmm. whatever. But, you know, it's a job. And that's part of And again, like, that, that's good world building to be like, this is why the conflict is not, like, out of control. Mm-hmm. It's just a conflict because it's just a whole bunch of, like, guys who have been given authority that don't deserve it, bullying people and, you know, doing grunt work for politicians that are jerks. So that's a good segue into world building. I just wanted to touch on like the three big things. Yeah, sure. Uh, the first one is the censorship and library acts that we get at the start of the show. They're not really well explained in the show. I'm sure they are in the books. Yeah, I would like for them to be a little more explained, but I think just the snippets of sort of how they work make sense logically, where it's just like, look, here's the baby we've cut in half. One, censorship is legal. Two, the library system is now allowed to carry any book. Yeah, and, and and it does work for the first half of the first episode. You're like, you're like, okay, this is the world that we're set up in. But then none of the following questions that you would naturally have ever get addressed, really. Like, because that's not important right now. What's what's yeah, important is kissing. Kissing. <laughs> kissing my, is what's important. Like, the very first question I had after that is, well, okay, why is it so important that anything gets censored? Like, what kinds of things get censored, uh, what, and why? Kissing books. Kissing books. Books that are important to the characters that make them not want to kiss. And Fahrenheit 451, turns out. Yeah, Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> Very specifically, <laughs> that, Fahrenheit That would be an important one. Well, the things that you see censored are, like, files about the history of the act that created censorship. Because, I mean, censorship's only about 20 years old, so it's like, eh, yeah, okay. And art that makes the, the government's position look bad. It's just... It, it never felt fleshed out enough to be like, okay, I get why I, I, I feel comfortable enough saying, yeah, this is okay. Like this world makes sense. Yeah. Well, cause again, it's just a backdrop for a Jose. Yeah. And like I said, when you frame it that way, none of these things really matter, but yeah, they really don't. Cause that's again, like that's not, that's not what the show is doing. The show is using an interesting backdrop and it does a decent job, like raising some interesting questions, but like it's primary focus is not ever really answering them. It's yeah. trying to get Kasahara and Dojo to kiss. <laughs> I forget if they actually do kiss. I don't remember. Uh, there's them there's an ending scene where she tr- uh, where she's uh, training too hard and she like hits a rock and slips and they almost kiss, falling into each other's arms as he's she's falling towards him. Mm. But that's about as close as you get. Yeah, I remember him head patting her, and that's about it. Like yeah, well. at the end, like the head pat. Uh, the Library Defense Force is the second one of the three. It mostly makes sense. At it least mostly from the holds char- together. From the character's perspective, it holds together, but because they all have very idealistic principles and we hear them all the time, yeah. that's probably why it makes more sense. Sometimes it doesn't, like in episode three, uh, Kasahara during a training exercise, like accidentally tips over a wheelchair while practicing to usher the uh, the commander Head. of the entire force. Yeah. And there's a reporter there and she sees it and she's like, so should I publish this? And like, if you could not do that, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, again, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I know, You're right? You're censoring stuff. <laughs> You're censoring stuff. Well, first off, I guess it sort of depends on how you look at it, right? Like, free press is important, but also she is a sympathetic uh, reporter to their side. And also, uh, you know, taking pictures of a one-off accident, context is everything. But well, yeah, if, it does. it does raise interesting questions. Yeah, if she had, like, looked at that photo and been, like, by herself, just gone, I'll just get rid of that one. Yeah, no, I agree. That'd, that'd <laughs> I agree that but that's she actually asked, stuff. what should I do with this? And, like, if you could not publish that, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Especially since I bring that up again later and they're totally on the other side. Like, but that one time you were, okay, whatever. Well, and it's what's fine. interesting about the show, and uh, again, like some questions that would be nice if it asked and like took itself a little more seriously with are things like that, right? Where like after the battle, there's a me- they the Library Defense Force wants to sort of media blackout uh, aggressive reporters asking about the, the final battle. Mm-hmm. It's like, these are interesting things because like, yeah, in theory, you're for free press and free expression, but how far does that go in the face of actual like political intrigue that you actually have to do? Right. Cause like you can't, you can't give the press complete free access to your organization and stuff like that's just, just a bad idea and you can't do it. Well, and, and what I was hoping for when you first pitched me this story and I didn't know it was Jose was either like, A story arc where the library is tempted to ban information by themselves, like what you just suggested, or 
like deal with a real censorship issue. Like the government needs to ban something dealing with there's a terrorist or there's national security issues here. Yeah. And the library now has a quandary because they kind of agree with the government that we should probably ban it. But at the same time, it goes against everything they stand for. And you actually have like a real conflict. Yeah. You get some tastes of that for both of those conflicts in the show, but you know, they're never really delivered because, again, the, at the end of the day, that's just not what the show is interested in in doing. Right. For better or worse. And the, the only other thing I'll nitpick about the Library Defense Force is for some reason, when they're doing field ops, like when they were trying to capture Fahrenheit 451, the Pro Book of Prophecy, for communication purposes, they use personal cell phones. Yeah, that's really <laughs> weird. Not only That's do they not use personal cell phones, but because they're the main communication vehicle look, in, in field ops, look, for some reason they don't charge them before the mission. Look, look, <laughs> look, if Hillary can do it, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm going to say. And, and what made me sort of mad about that was it put a little black mark on Shibazaki because the show tries to show us that she's a really good friend and she kept trying to call uh, Kasahara throughout the entire ordeal because she didn't know yeah. who she was but her phone was dead but she kept trying to call her and that's very sweet until you realize but that's the main mode of communication and if she's really worried about her why would she be possibly blowing up her phone and blocking legit communications yeah I suppose like if you're well, going to use cell phones at least use like a company phone to be and fair, we're, and we're shown fair. later that they actually do have field radios that they actually yeah. use, but for well, some okay. reason they don't use them in field ops. So I'll for some do it. Come. Do it. Let's let's do this. I mean, there's not there's not a huge reason. It's just oh. this field op was not supposed to. It's supposed to be a very simple like just go get this thing and come back. We'll sure, but even 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 police, normal oh, police, no, I, have I, I radios. Agree. It's I like, agree. Come on, <laughs> come on. I agree. I'll give it to you. Because, yeah. again, at the end of the day, I can shrug it all off. It's a Jose. It's a Jose. <laughs> yeah, and, and the last uh, part of the world building is the government, which is... Kind of a non-entity in it, I which is kind of interesting. I don't know what is going on with them at all. The biggest question I had throughout the entire thing, and I think you touched on this a little bit, is if the government is that serious about censorship, why do they keep going after the books after they've hit retail shelves instead of being part of the publishing process? Yeah, well, I think it's only been, again, it hasn't been super long. So they, they, I assume they're getting many things in the pipeline. Also, I imagine that there are plenty of authors that, you know, do a self-published thing and then donate it directly to the library. And those are also, that's another reason that the Betterment people would actually have the muster to go try see, to attack the libraries directly. Yeah, I like that. But this is, this is just headcanon stuff that you have to do to try and yeah. fix the cracks and i, I like that but, answer if they had just mentioned that yeah like, no exactly it's like yeah this guy's publishing his own show. uh his own dogens off mini discs that he found in a yeah. box once exactly <laughs> we want to get rid of those they are uh they're polluting the youth i mean they did well at least fairies they pollute fairies so <laughs> absolutely you gotta gotta watch out for that last thing i want to discuss is the directing because i feel like this it's, is this it's is the, not an this is not an animation powerhouse the art style is very cute. I like the very thick lines that are used. I do like that. But uh, it's not an animation powerhouse. The best part of the show are all the little uh, reaction, little emotes that Kasahara yeah. has throughout the show that just completely jar with everything else. Yeah. Because they're so lively and they're great. Yeah. And they belong in a Jose, but not in a military drama. <laughs> I know, right? So I actually looked this up and it's the guy's first directorship. And that would subsequently, make sense. it's also his last directorship. Oh, that's sad. Uh, he's mostly been a, a keyframe animator. That's been oh, his really? thing. And a lot of directors get their start that way. I get yeah, that. yeah. But he directed this and he's not directed anything since. Yeah, well, again, like it's not, I wouldn't say the, the again, also the animation is not really why you watch it. You watch it for the cute characters doing, you know, cute sure. Jose E things. But I found the direction and animation just inoffensive. Uh, a little odd at times, but that's about it. The thing that really got me was like episode three when a lot of th weird things happened. First of all, we had just nonstop close up, static shot, close up, static shot, close up, static shot, just over and over and over for no reason. There's this five minute long scene where Kasahara is talking to Shibazaki and Shibazaki is doing her makeup. And for some reason, we keep getting these like Dutch angles and cropped 
frames of Kasahara's face where she's like supposed to be enigmatic. I think at least that's how yes. she's kind of framed, but we're never shown her full face. Like it's a special reveal who Kasahara is, but we already know who she is because we saw her last two episodes. I don't what's what's I got really confused by that. But the really jarring thing about that episode was in the first episode, when you're introduced to all the characters, they get their little name tags up on the screen sh- saying yeah. who they are and what rank they are and kind of their nicknames and stuff. Yep. They do it again in episode three. They do it for the first couple episodes. And it's like, did you think we forgot their names? Because you're right. I did forget their <laughs> names. <laughs> but it's kind of sad that you had you thought that I needed reminding. Doesn't really reflect very well on you. Yeah. Yeah. Some other things, though, were like you said, nothing was really said about censorship per se. It was mostly yeah. just a Jose. Yep. None of the fights ever felt tense because by the end, you sort of realize that no one never got hurt. Well, they get hurt. They just don't die. <laughs> they just don't die. No one dies. It's a lot of non-lethal shots. Yeah, there's a constant problem with explanations coming in just when they're at needed. the right time. Yeah. They're never foreshadowed. It's just like, hey, there's this new thing that everyone seems to know and would have been nice to have mentioned before now. But OK, yeah, everything is just so idealistic and there's just so many not deaths in a show called Library War. Yeah, well, in Read or Die, I'm not sure how many people die. <laughs> or read. Actually, well, there's a lot of reading in Read or Die. Let's <laughs> not joke around that bush. <laughs> a lot of reading there. I don't think there are many people die. I think Mr. Gentleman dies at the end. Sure. So I don't remember much of Read or Die. Well, are we talking about the OVA or the, uh, the TV I, show? I saw the... The OVA, but I don't think I ever saw the TV show. TV show's pretty good. That's what I hear. I've just never seen it. Pacing's weird. OVA is just bonkers. It really is. It's very (laughs) good. It's super bonkers. (laughs) Very cray. There's a man with a 17th century battery pack that he uses to blow up the White House and rides a giant grasshopper. It's very good. It's a very good show. So, you know. (laughs) Very good. There you go. So, final thoughts on Library Wars? Hey, if you if you want a Jose set in <laughs> set in Fahrenheit four five one, I got you covered. Uh, or equilibrium. It could be equilibrium where um, falls in love with his kohai, and it, and they kiss a lot, or not at all. There's a lot no, of head they don't pets. kiss. There's a lot of head pets. There's a lot of almost kissing. There's a lot of cute feelings. Yeah, it could it, have been a much stronger story and with much better character development if it had like addressed some real issues. Well, it depends, again, like, what did the show set out to do? I posit it set out to be a Jose with a military backdrop, in which case it succeeded. But if it was a military drama with a romance angle, then it does not live up. And I feel, and let's be honest, I feel like they were trying for the second one and accidentally succeeded in the first. I don't think so. Really? You don't think so? Yeah, no. I think this is toe to tip. That's a Jose. Okay. I, I I can see it both ways. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a fair argument. And again, like if that's what you wanted, then it's like, yeah, well, that's just not what this is. It yeah. it it seems like it might be trying to be that, but I don't think it ever really is, at least not wholeheartedly. I think it very much set out to be a Jose with a military backdrop. And they're like, how do I what sort of military backdrop should I do? It's like, how about censorship, I guess? Sure, it's fine. It's been done. It's yeah. safe. I, I think that's at the end of the day what it is. So what about next time? Have I finally convinced you to watch No Game, No Life? Uh, you haven't convinced me. I just said, yeah, okay. Yay, that's convincing. Not really. It's like yep. saying you won an argument because I stopped arguing with you. <laughs> we all have to make sacrifices in our lives. I think you'll like it. Sure. I, th- I think you will. I think you will not hate it as much as you think you will. I just I don't. Can't, I, I can't I, promise that you'll love it, but I think bits of it, major parts of it will appeal to you. We'll see. We'll see. So we will see you next time on Anarchy.